Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Darcy, and in today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about cells, the smallest unit of life. I'm going to be discussing prokaryotic cells, um, including bacteria, and eukaryotic cells, which includes both animal cells, um, plant cells, and fungi. So let's get started. Okay, so cells and organelles. Let's start with the definition of a cell. A cell is the smallest unit that is capable of performing the functions associated with life. Now, you may ask yourself, what about viruses? Um, they're alive, aren't they? Well, most scientists don't think they are, and um, with good reason as well. You see, a virus cannot exist outside a cell. It cannot perform any of the functions of life outside of a cell. It cannot respire, it cannot metabolize, cannot produce proteins, cannot move. To do any of this stuff, it requires a host cell, whether that be an animal cell, whether that be a plant cell, a fungi, or even a bacteria. Um, so viruses, they need cells to live in. So the, un the smallest real unit of life is known as the cell. So we're gonna go through cell structure and then we'll talk about the organelles of cells. The organelles of a cell are kind of like the organs of a body. They all have very specific functions, just like the organs of the body. So cell structure. Living things are termed organisms. Organisms comprise of one or more cells. Cells can be divided into two basic types, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. This is from the Greek, by the way. Um, prokaryotes, um, derives from pro prokaryon, which means before nucleus. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. And then there are eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, eukaryon, means true nucleus. All eukaryotes do have a nucleus. So the bacteria are prokaryotes, animal and plant cells, amongst others, are eukaryotes. The arrangement of living things. Cells, the most basic unit. A group of cells together are known as a tissue. Tissue, similar cell types working together. Then we have the organ. Different tissues working together become an organ. So for example, the stomach equals muscle, blood, and skin tissues, which are all different forms of tissue. Then we have organ systems, um, different organs that work together. For example, the nervous system consists of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves, whereas the cardiovascular system um, cont contains the heart um, and the blood vessels amongst other units. So history of cell science. The term cell was coined by Robert Hooke in the late 1600s. Hooke used a microscope to observe small room-like structures which he called cells as they reminded him of the rooms, the cells, that monks lived in at the time. Anton von, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, I apologize. Anton von Leeuwenhoek also became famous, famous for his observations of living cells. In the preceding two centuries, better microscopes enabled scientists to observe cells more closely. So here's a summary of that. What we're looking at on the right uh, basic, is basically a, um, uh, a microscopic image of cork which is a form of wood. And you can see cells within that cork. Um, and at the bottom, we're seeing various different types of cells. So, well, we're seeing images through a microscope. So Robert Hooke, mid 1600s, observed um, a sliver of cork, saw rows of empty boxes, coined the term cell. Anton van Leeuwenhoek was the first to view organisms, living things, um, using a microscope. He used a simple handheld microscope to view pond water and scrapings from his teeth and saw all these tiny little creatures. Um, and um, books were published with these microscopy images and they were a sensation at the time. 1839, Theodore Schwann and Matthias Schleiden stated all living things are made of cells. 50 years later, Rudolf Virchow stated all cells come from cells, meaning one cell divides to make a new cell. This was not certain until that point. Many people 
believe that cells would spontaneously arise. Um, people actually believe that animals would spontaneously arise. You would throw some dirty rags in the corner of a barn and miraculously mice would appear from those dirty rags. The same with flies originating from meat. Um, but close observation revealed that this to be false. All living things are, ma are made of cells. Smallest living unit of structure and function of all organisms is the cell. All cells arise from pre-existing cells. This principle discarded the idea of spontaneous generation, which I discussed a moment ago. Here are some different cells. Uh, cells come in all sorts of sizes. Um, so you get a big variation in cell size. Prokaryotic cells are much smaller than eukaryotic cells and viruses are much smaller than even prokaryotic cells. As you can see, this is not to scale this image. Just look at the sizes here. Some example cells, amoeba, a plant stem cell, bacteria, red blood cell, nerve cell. These are all different forms of cells. Cells come in all different shapes and sizes. And characteristics of all cells. Um, they all have a surrounding membrane to keep the outside out and the inside in. Although those membranes have little pores and channels and pumps to move waste products out and to take nutrients in. The cytoplasm of the, uh, is the is the liquid basically that various structures um, within the cell float in. So the cytoplasm is a pool in the inside of the cell that various organelles float around in and nutrients are moved around in also. Organelles are structures with, within the cell floating in the cytoplasm. So floating is a bit of an exaggeration. They're actually hooked on to the cytoskeleton of the cell and they move kind of like as if they're walking along the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is very thin, by the way. Organelle structure is essential for cell function. DNA is the coding material of the cell. So prokaryotic cells, they have no membrane-bound nucleus. As you can see here, the DNA is just in a big coil, known as a nucleoid, in the center of the cell. Organelles um, not bound by membranes. So there's no endoplasmic reticulum, no lysosomes, no um, Golgi apparatus, etc. I'll talk about those shortly. Um, it's a very simple structure, the prokaryotic cell. It has various structures around it. It has the pili, capsule, cell wall, plasma membrane, nucleoid, cytoplasm, ribosomes, the protein factories of the cell, and the flagella to allow the, the cell to float around, to move around. Uh, I'll explain what these different structures do shortly. Um, the one to kind of make note of right now is the ribosome. For any type of cell to live, it needs to make proteins. We are all made of various proteins, our enzymes, our collagen in our skin, our keratin in our hair, all sorts of proteins. Proteins are made by ribosomes. The information to make the proteins, the instructions, is carried in the DNA in the form of genes. Um, but these instructions need to be carried to the ribosome, which then makes the protein. Eukaryotic cells, they um, are nucleus. The nucleus is bound by a membrane. There is a nuclear membrane, sometimes called a nuclear envelope, around the DNA. Um, eukaryotic cells include fungi, protists, plant and animal cells. They can possess many, many different organelles. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. They are surrounded by a cell wall, a hard cell wall to protect them from drying out, etc., and a plasma membrane. Um, plasma membranes allow various um, nutrients to flow into the cell and waste products out. Some are surrounded also by a capsule, kind of like a wax capsule which once again protects the cell. Ribosomes are the only organelles found in the cytoplasm. Examples are bacterial cells and blue-green algae. Eukaryotic cells. They have a nucleus with a nuclear envelope. They are surrounded by a plasma membrane. Some are surrounded by cell wall, for example the, plant, the plants and the fungi. Others are not the um, animals. 
Cytoplasm contains a variety of organelles. Examples are plant cells and animal cells. Here is a animal eukaryotic cell. Um, nothing here is to scale. Um, the structures that you're seeing inside, there are many, many thousands of them, um, all different sizes. This is just a schematic overview of a animal cell. We can see we have this rough endoplasmic reticulum. We have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, no dots on it. The dots, by the way, are ribosomes. We see the mitochondria, powerhouses of the cell. Uh, we see the lysosomes, the stomach of the cell. We see centrioles, which help the cell to divide. Golgi apparatus, which help to transport various proteins and other nutrients around the cell. A nuclear, uh, a nucleus with a nuclear membrane, nuclear envelope around it. Nuclear pores, so that things can come in out of the nucleus. And DNA in the middle. A plant cell has all the same structures as an animal cell and a couple of extra ones. For example, the chloroplast here, which allows the plant cell to turn sunlight into energy. Um, and also a solid cell wall and plasmodesmata to allow one plant cell to connect to the next. Organelles, they are the cellular machinery. There are two general kinds derived from membranes. These are bacteria-like organelles. Bacteria-like organelles derive from symbi symbiotic bacteria. You see, originally, and I'm going to go into this shortly, but I'll give you an overview first. Originally, there was just the prokaryotes, these simple, tiny cells with only ribosomes and no other organelles. And they existed for many, many millions of years. Um, when the earth formed. And then a larger type of cell evolved from bacteria known as an archaea. They are larger, but they are still pretty much, pretty much similar to a prokaryote. These archaea um, were not capable of using oxygen um, as an energy source. Some bacteria were. They weren't capable of using um, sunlight as an energy source. Some bacteria were and are. Um, they lived by eating bacteria. Um, but one day they had indigestion. They failed to digest certain bacteria. Um, one, at some point in the past, one archaea failed to digest a oxygen using bacteria. And therefore, this oxygen using bacteria survived in the much larger cytoplasm of the eukaryote, but it carried on using oxygen as, a, as an energy source and gave off energy in the form of a molecule called ATP to the host cell. So these, um, these archaea were now able to use oxygen as an energy source, which is quite a good energy source. So they could go quicker, divide quicker, colonize the planet. These were the first eukaryotic cells from a fusion of a prokaryotic cell and an archaea. This happened again when some um, eukaryotic cell or archaea fused or ate a, um, a light using prokaryote. So a prokaryotic cell that could use sunlight as an energy source. This, or this um, bacteria, this prokaryote, survived within the archaea and became the chloroplast symbiotic theory. So as an ancient association, eukaryotic cells are symbiotic organisms, a combination of archaea and prokaryotes. So endosymbiotic theory, the evolution of modern cells from cells and symbiotic bacteria. It was in 1970 that the American biologist Lynn Margulis provided evidence that some organelles within cells were at one time free living cells themselves. Supporting evidence included organelles with their own DNA, the chloroplast and the mitochondria. You see chloroplasts and mitochondria both have their own DNA separate from the DNA of the nucleus. Um, and the DNA is circular. Um, the DNA in eukaryotes is not circular, it's linear, linear chromosomes. Bacterial DNA is circular and so is 
but so is mitochondria, mitochondrial DNA, and chloroplast DNA, which gives some strong evidence. Plus, chloroplasts and mitochondria are about the same size as bacteria and have a similar structure. Rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is the next organelle I'm going to talk about. Um, here we can see a Golgi apparatus and some endoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to get to Golgi apparatus later, but these two images are here together. So you can see there's a sort of similar shape. They both have membranes, various membranes. Um, and these membranes um, separate the inside of the organelle from the outside. So, endoplasmic reticulum, parallel flattened cavities lined with thin membranes. And there are channels in these membranes to let various proteins, etc., in and out. But four nanometers thick. Attached to the membrane are ribosomes in the rough ER. So you see these dots. These are ribosomes which make protein. So they're used for protein transport. Here we can see we've got ribosomes on rough endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum here, again compared with the Golgi apparatus, it's similar to the rough ER, just doesn't have the ribosomes on. It's a site of um, the sites of lipid manufacture, fat manufacture. So certain steroids, for example, just to give you a comparison, um, certain steroids, which are hormones, are made of fat, cholesterol specifically. So um, testosterone and estrogen are both made of cholesterol, fat, and they are manufactured in the smooth ER, whereas protein hormones, such as adrenaline, are manufactured in the rough ER. They need ribosomes to make protein. So the tubes are rather flattened, so they're rather than flattened stacks, they they're responsible for the synthesis and transport of lipid band steroids. Now let's zoom in on that Golgi apparatus, a stack of flattened cisternae. These are known as cisternae. Formed by fusion of vesicles from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Vesicles are just bits of of um, endoplasmic reticulum membrane that bud off to carry molecules to the Golgi apparatus where they fuse and deposit their cargo. Um, vesicles pinch off the transface and move to the cell membrane. So basically, the Golgi apparatus can modify various substances within it, and then those substances can be transported in vesicles to the cell membrane for release. So secretion. And here we can see some Golgi apparatus on an electron microgram. The mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, its main function is to generate ATP, which is the fuel of the cell. Diameter, about 1.0 micrometers. Length, about 2 to 5 micrometers. You can see it's got an outer membrane, an inner membrane, a matrix. DNA, etc. Surrounded by two membranes. Inner membrane folded to form cristae. This is where respiration occurs. Oxidative phosphorylation. The oxygen, um, the oxygen that we breathe in reacts with various enzymes and energy, uh, an energy source such as glucose or ketone bodies or even proteins. And the, um, the end result is that we end up producing ATP um, in the mitochondria. The matrix is the fluid inside used for producing ATP in aerobic respiration. And here is an electron micrograph of a mitochondria. Contains circular DNA. Contains ribosomes, known as 70S ribosomes. The ribosomes of bacteria, prokaryotes, are different than the ribosomes of eukaryotes. The ribosome in the prokaryote is very similar to that in the mitochondria. So here are ribosomes zoomed in. Ribosomes come in two pieces, a large and a small subunit, which fuse together to allow for the production of protein. Um, I'm not gonna talk about DNA in any depth right now, but basically um, 
let's take a human cell. We have about 25,000 genes within our chromosomes. The DNA consists of double strands, um, a double helix. Um, and within that double helix, we have a series of nucleotide bases, A, T, C, and G. And they have a code to make, amongst other things, proteins. So what happens is the DNA double strands at a particular gene will open up. Um, an enzyme called RNA polymerase will read the message on that gene and make a product known as messenger RNA, which carries the message, it floats away to the ribosome. The ribosome reads the message encoded by the messenger RNA and makes the appropriate protein. So if you have a gene for making insulin, then that will produce a messenger RNA strand, which carries the instructions to make insulin, which will go to a ribosome, ribosome will read it and put together the building blocks of the insulin protein, the amino acids. It's more complicated than that, but that's for another lecture. There are two types of ribosomes. The smaller ones, 70S, are found in mitochondria and chloroplasts. The larger ones, 80S, are found in the cytoplasm and attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Lysosomes, the stomach of the cell contain digestive enzymes, they destroy bacteria. So when one of our white blood cells comes along and encounters a bacteria, it eats it, much as the ancient archaea did and current archaea still do. Um, and then that bacteria is fused with the lysosome, which contains all these digestive enzymes and it is destroyed. So our white blood cells have many lysosomes, but all of our cells have lysosomes because we need to recycle various material such as our old damaged organelles. And um, can destroy a whole cell. Here is a lysosome, 0.25 micrometers. Here's a chloroplast. Quite complicated structures, not going to go into their function in too much detail, but their purpose really is to turn sunlight into energy, into various structures. The end result of which is the generation of amino acids, of which make proteins, of, of sugars, which make carbohydrates, of fats, all of these things. Beginning of the food chain. There's a double membrane. Inside is the stroma. We have phylacoids, which are membranes stacked on top of each other to form a grana. The membranes contain chlorophyll pigment. Um, also contains 70S ribosomes and small circular DNA. Again, giving a hint to the ancestry as free floating, free living prokaryotic cells, about five to 10 micrometers in length. Then we have the centrioles. The centrioles are important when a cell needs to divide. When a cell divides, first of all, it replicates its DNA and its organelles and grows larger. Then centrioles move to opposite sides of the cell. They extend spindle fibers, which take hold of the various chromosomes, each copy of the replicated DNA. And then everything is pulled to opposite poles of the cells. The cell divides in two. You have two daughter cells. Centrioles are essential for this process. Barrel-shaped organelle found only in animal cells used in cell division. It is a pinwheel formation of nine groups of three microtubules. And here we go. Microvilli, these little folds on the surface of the cell. Um, minute projections on the cell wall increase its surface area one micrometer long and 0.8 micrometers wide. There we go. When you zoom in, you can see the surface of the cell. Now, now, this gives a greater surface area to allow nutrients to be absorbed. Our intestine has many microvilli so that we can absorb food during digestion. The cell wall. Um, so, for example, in a plant, the cell wall is made of, of cellulose. Um, animal cells don't have a cell wall. Um, fungi do that. It gives plant cells the shape, can be lignified to make it even stronger. Then we have vacuoles and tonoplast. Tonoplast is a semi-permeable membrane surrounding a vacuole, a space in plant cells. 
The vacuole stores food, water, and waste products. It gives support to soft structures such as leaves. Here we go. When you zoom in, you can see an electron micrograph. The plasmodesmata, these structures that connect plant cells together, one to the next, so that nutrients can flow between cells, or the phloem, for example, within a, a stem. On this island, for that matter. Only found in plant cells, microscopic channels which traverse the cell walls of plant cells. They enable transport and communication between them. Zoomed in, you can see what they look like, little bumps. The cell membrane, when you zoom in, is actually quite complex. Um, cell membranes contain all sorts of structures, uh, pumps, channels, um, receptors, various other things, so that products can be moved into the cell, out of the cell, the cell can be spoken to by other cells using things such as hormones, etc. It consists of a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, a phospholipid is basically a phosphate head with two lipid tails. Um, so the lipids are fat, therefore water-hating, hydrophobic. The head, the phosphate, is um, basically hydrophilic, it likes water. So you get these two layers, and as you can see, the phosphate on the outside of one layer is going to be in contact with the water around the cell, um, whereas the lipid um, tails, they're gonna come in contact with the lipid tails of the next layer to avoid water because they're hydrophobic. And then the phosphates of the bottom layer are going to be in contact with the water, the cytoplasm within the cell gives you a membrane. And there are all sorts of structures within that membrane, various proteins, cholesterol to give the cell, a cell membrane a bit of rigidity, glycolipids, meaning lipids with sugars on them, um, all sorts of other structures. Semi-permeable membrane. Contails, contains cell contents. Double layer of phospholipids and proteins. You can see here, zooming in, we have the hydrophobic head, the phosphate, and the, sorry, the hydrophilic head, the phosphate, and the hydrophobic tails, the lipids. Phospholipids are known as polar. When you have, um, uh, if you are hydrophilic at one end and hydrophobic at the other, you are polar. Here we can see the full structure, zoomed in even more. Uh, phosphoric acid, alcohol, um, uh, glycerol, um, fatty acid tails, phospholipid. Movement across the membrane, a few molecules move freely. Water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and oxygen. Carrier proteins transport some molecules, um, proteins embedded in the lipid bilayer. There's a fluid mosaic model describes fluid nature of a lipid bilayer. So those proteins, those receptors, those channels, they sort of move laterally through the membrane. It's a fluid of sorts. Membrane proteins include channels or transporters, which move molecules in one direction, in to out, out to in, depending on the direction of the channel. Receptors, which recognize certain chemicals, such as hormones. We have glycoproteins, which identify the cell type. So think of the cell as having glycoproteins on its surface, which say to other cells what type of cell they are. Certain cells um, have different glycoproteins on them um, and exist, live in different parts of the body. There are enzymes which catalyze the production of substances. They stick small molecules together to make big molecules, or big molecules get ripped apart to make small molecules. Um, anabolic enzymes, catabolic enzymes, anabolic build things, catabolic split things apart. Here, once again, is a prokaryotic cell, unicellular, one to five uh, micrometers in diameter. They lack membrane-bound organelles, so no rough EI, no smooth EI, no mitochondria, no chloroplasts, no Golgi apparatus. They have a naked circular piece of DNA within them called a nucleon. And they have 70S ribosomes, just like the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. 
They have a cell wall, but it's made of peptidoglycan, not cellulose. Peptidoglycan, very important. Um, many antibiotics destroy bacteria by actually interacting and breaking apart the cell wall of bacteria, the peptidoglycan, making holes in them. You make a hole in a bacteria, in its cell wall, water will come in, the cell will swell and pop. That's how many antibiotics um, function. So let's go through functions of eukaryotic cell organelles first. We'll move on to prokaryotic shortly. The cell wall. Strength stops cells bursting in dilute solutions. Plasma membrane. Selectively controls the movement of substances into and out of the cell. Allows cell identification from those glycoproteins on the surface and cell adhesion. Things such as plasma dismata, amongst others. Nucleus contains DNA, mitochondria produce large amounts of ATP by aerobic respiration. So they're the powerhouse of the cell. Chloroplast absorbs light energy for photosynthesis in plants. Rough ER, rough endoplasmic reticulum, protein synthesis, that's what the ribosomes do there, speeds up the distribution of uh, produced substances through the cytoplasm. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum, smooth ER, is responsible for the synthesis of lipids such as steroid hormones, no ribosome. The Golgi apparatus stores and modifies substances, e.g. joins carbohydrates to proteins to form glycoproteins and releases them in vesicles. The lysosome, the stomach of the cell, contains enzymes used to digest proteins. White blood cells have a lot of them. The microvilli are folds in the plasma membrane of the cell which increase the surface area for the absorption of nutrients. Ribosomes, responsible for protein synthesis, I should say, but not all ribosomes are attached to ER to make smooth ER. Some ribosomes are loose floating in the cytoplasm. The proteins that they make are released directly into the cytoplasm. Vesicles contain substances released from the Golgi apparatus. Protein production, let's just sort of briefly mention that. Um, I talk about this more in, a, in another lecture. Uh, proteins are made at ribosomes. Ribosomes on rough ER make proteins that are excreted or attached to the cell membrane. Free ribosomes in the cytoplasm make proteins that stay in the cytoplasm. New proteins are folded and processed, e.g. sugar chains are added. Um, then the proteins are transported to the Golgi apparatus in the vesicles. Proteins enter more vesicles to be transported around the cell. Um, e.g. the extracellular enzymes, such as digestive enzymes, that move to cell surface and are secreted. Bacterial cell prokaryotes, let's go in more detail about those. Some have a capsule found outside the cell wall. It's a slimy layer that protects the cell and stops it from drying out, protects them. Cell wall made of peptidoglycan, which is composed of a carbohydrate, and of carbohydrate and amino acid proteins. The purpose is to support the cell and to maintain its shape. It also prevents certain substances from entering the cell, including water, um, which in turn prevents, um, this is space there in the word in turn, prevents the cell from bursting by too much water intake via osmosis. Plasma membrane, composed of phospholipids and proteins, controls entry and exit of substances. Partial, permeable, semi-permeable. Genetic material is in a circular structure known as the nucleoid within the bacteria, the prokaryotes. Found in the cytoplasm, no nucleus is present, contains genes for proteins that the bacterial cell needs for growth and reproduction. Here we can see zoomed in. Uh, that's not a zoom in at the top, by the way. That's just a, a drawing. Here we have a zoom in, though, from micrograph. Yeah. The plasmids, little circular pieces of DNA that are separate from the nucleoid. They're actually much smaller relative to the uh, nucleoid than that, but this is just an illustration. So some bacterial cells contain additional DNA in the form of plasmids. Small circular pieces of DNA containing genes for things such as antibiotic resistance. And these plasmids can be transported from one bacteria to another through little channels known as pili. Great importance in genetic engineering. 
um, we can engineer plasmids and put a gene in for something like insulin and then put that plasmid into a bacteria, grow lots of them, and those bacteria will then make insulin, human insulin. So genetic engineering allows us to engineer plasmids to make useful compounds in medicine and research. Ribosomes, smaller than eukaryotic ribosomes, made of RNA and protein. So ribosomes, all ribosomes, are made of a type of RNA called ribosomal RNA, which is folded up, and various proteins. The two subunits involved in protein synthesis. So gallum is the tail of bacteria. By the way, it's not just prokaryotes that have a flagella. Some eukaryotes do, that's how sperm swim around. Um, they rotate from the base in a kind of corkscrew shape to allow swimming. Some bacteria have just one. Some have one on either side. Some have multiple all the way around to allow them to swim in different directions. Next, the cytoskeleton. The, these cells here have been stained, so you can see all these little fibers moving through the cell. This is the cytoskeleton. It's responsible for holding the cell's shape in a particular configuration, and organelles are attached to the cytoskeleton, so they don't all just fall to the bottom. So the organelle is surrounded by cytoplasm, which has a network of protein threads, the cytoskeleton. In eukaryotic cells, the protein threads are arranged into microfilaments and microtubules. Uh, so microfilaments are small, solid strands, and microtubules are cylinders. Four main functions. The microtubules and microfilaments support organelles, keeping them in position and helping them to move. Um, it helps strengthen cell and maintain its shape, responsible for transport of materials within the cell, e.g. movement of chromosomes during cell division. The proteins of the cytoskeleton may cause a cell to move, e.g. cilia and flagella can move due to protein filaments running through them. In single cells, the cytoskeleton propels the whole cell. So here's just a summary. I'm not going to read through it. Maybe um, hit pause and, uh, and have a look at this in your own time. But this is basically comparing the various different um, organelles that animal, bacterial, and plant cells have. Thank you very much for watching, as always. Um, here's my Twitter handle, at Mark of the D, at M-A-R-K-O-F-T-H-E, capital D. Um, that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening, and I will speak to you again very soon. Goodbye.